everyone to this help session before our Custal Deformation Modeling Workshop in about a week and a half. Uh, the plan for this session is we'll uh, give an overview of a pilot using some slides and then Charles Williams will, uh, will run through um, so a, a hands-on example uh, showing generation of the mesh using trellis, um, which is essentially identical to qubit. Um, uh, and then he'll run pilot, and then he'll visualize the results in pair view. And he'll walk through sort of the various stages of what's going on. Um, so I see a question. Um, uh, so we'll, do, we'll go through the installation. Um, with Charles at the beginning, uh, but continue. If you already have questions, please go ahead and enter them in the lower half Q and A panel, um, and that helps us. That's better than the chat panel um, because it helps us keep track of what questions still have left to be answered and which ones are which ones have been answered. Um, so, without further ado. Let's get started and start uh, talking about Pyleth. So uh, Pyleth is used in crustal deformation modeling. Uh, right now its focus is on elasticity, uh, where the geometry does not change. For earthquakes um, with quasi-static modeling, that is no inertia, and that, or, and that means no seismic waves. These types of problems are generally associated with thing, answering questions about strain accumulation associated with inner seismic deformation, such as what is the stressing rate on uh, various faults, what is, where is strain accumulated in the crust, also uh, co-seismic stress changes and fault slip. For example, what was the slip distribution in earthquake A based on geodetic data? How did the earthquake A change the stresses on the surrounding faults? Uh, other category of questions would be post related to post seismic relaxation of the crust, such as what is the rheology, what rheology is consistent with observed post seismic deformation, and can a seismic or after slip explain the observed deformation? Other classes of problems um, are dynamic modeling uh, associated with earthquakes. Uh, generally strong ground motions, that's ground motions close to the fault. Um, not, we're not talking about sort of regional wave propagation over distances greater than around about 100 kilometers. Most of that is just due to the, the accuracy and efficiency of the code. Um, but it's uh, primarily used uh, for uh, spontaneous rupture simulations where you put in friction or prescribed slip and computing the ground motions and looking at things like uh, basin excited waves, uh, interaction between the rupture and basins, and so forth. Um, it also uh, is used in examining coast seismic stress changes and fault slip in, in the dynamics instead of not just sort of the, the static stress changes, but the dynamic coast seismic stress changes and the earthquake rupture behavior. Pyleth can also be used in volcano deformation problems, um, such as those associated with magma chambers and or dikes. Uh, in dike inflation or magma chamber inflation, um, some of the questions that are often asked is what is the geometry of the magma chamber and from the deformation? So you're sticking in uh, a magma chamber with, with some geometry and then using Pyleth to um, compute what the deformation is based on the 3D uh, structure. Uh, and one then might infer what's the potential for an eruption. Um, relating to the deformation, if there's an ongoing eruption and you, and you have geodetic data, you may be asking, you know, where is the deformation occurring deeper related to the magma chamber? Um, where are the dike intrusions? The questions often asked are what is the geometry of the intrusion and what is the pressure change and or amount of opening and dilatation. Pyleth is a community code in that uh, we actively develop it with uh, input from the community. Uh, I am 
Brad Agard. I'm from the USGS in Menlo Park. I tend to be the lead developer. Uh, Charles Williams at GNS Science in New Zealand, formerly at RPI in New York, is uh, one of the other developers, as well as Matthew, Matt Neptley, who is currently at the University of Chicago, formerly at Argonne National Labs. Matt Neptley is um, one of the CIG computational scientists, um, and Charles and I are uh, earth scientists, geophysicists, um, and uh, we come with sort of support from our own agencies. Uh, the idea of Pilot came out of the um, of Charles and I having our own codes, and we decided to um, that had a lot of overlap in terms of their modeling capabilities, and we decided we'd combine the dynamic capability is my code called EQSIM with the quasi-static capability of Tekton that Charles had worked on for a number of years. Um, both of them solved earthquakes. They just looked at different time scales. Um, and we decided that uh, we could leverage our own the capabilities and uh, work of the other by combining them into a single code. And within CIG, um, use CIG to sort of develop a, a more modern code and take advantage of uh, ideas coming from the computational side. Uh, so we use modern software engineering ideas such as modular design, testing, documentation, and uh, a robust distribution system to develop an open source community code. And you may ask, well, where, where does sort of Pilot fit in sort of the whole workflow of doing a research problem. And that's what this diagram uh, attempts to do, is to show Pilot here uh, in the orange box here, at the CIG code. Um, it handles the physics. In a typical crustal deformation problem, you start with your geologic structure um, that is often defined. Here we've shown two commercial packages that are used for sort of major initiatives. Uh, GoCAD uh, is used in Southern California for doing faults in the seismic velocity model. Uh, in Northern California, USGS has used Earth Vision to create a 3D geologic model. Um, most on the, sometimes on the research side, you may have access to those packages. Other times, you're just uh, basing it off of other people's uh, work or data files for the fault geometry. Then the next major piece of the puzzle is the mesh generation. Uh, when we started developing Pilot, uh, we worked with Carl Gable, who um, has developed LaGrit out of uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, at that time, Qubit was still sort of just learning to get started on the on sort of the geodynamics problems. Um, since then, uh, we switched to more towards using Qubit and Trellis for a mesh generation, primarily because it has a nice GUI interface. Uh, LaGrit was command line driven. Um, it was not 64-bit, um, so it was much more difficult, much, much steeper learning curve. TetGen is a, another uh, open source package for Tetrahedra. It doesn't have um, as nice of an interface, and you generally have to have the parts of the mesh set such as that on the boundaries already in place. Gmesh is, is another open source package. Um, we are considering porting, and we've done some experimentation with seeing if those two packages can supply the necessary information. But we've had sort of limited success in really diving into it. Um, for the physics code, Pilot uh, is really meant for 3D problems um, or 2D problems where you, where you can't use semi-analytic or, or spectral methods. Um, Relax is, a, is another code that uses semi-analytic methods uh, and uh, sort of does things in the Fourier domain that uh, allows you to, to do things very quickly, but it has much more limitations. You can't include topography. You can't include certain lateral 3D variations in the physical properties. GeoFest is a uh, code out of JPL um, that has some viscoelastic uh, parameters and, and uh, for handling viscoelastic deformation. It's sort of a modern version of the original Tecton. Um, and then you can go the full commercial route with 
a package like Abacus, who does pretty much everything under the sun. Uh, for visualization, we primarily use Paraview because it's quite easy to use. Uh, Visit is another uh, open source package that also uses the VTK file format. Uh, you can use MATLAB to do some visualization or post-processing. We generally do that uh, with HDF5 files or use Python instead. Matplotlib is good for, um, it's a Python open source package that's good for visualizing time histories, plotting 2D things, whereas Paraview is primarily 3D, um, and Relax can dump things out to GMT. Um, so that's sort of where things fit in terms of uh, where Pilot fits in the workflow, and you get an idea of the various steps that are involved. Now we'll uh, briefly discuss the governing equations. Um, these are all discussed in the manual in more detail and, and their derivation uh, all the way from uh, the governing equations to the equations we're uh, solving uh, in the code. Um, right now, Pyleth is limited to the elasticity equation uh, written here in index notation. So we have uh, equilibrium, tractions on the boundaries, prescribed displacements, and then slip on the fault. And we formulate our uh, weak form for the governing equation uh, in terms of our finite element discretization by taking our governing equation and multiplying by a weight function and integrating over the volume and then equal to zero. This is called the weak form because we're not requiring our governing equation to be held strictly equal to zero over the entire volume. We're sort of on some average sense, we want it to be equal to zero. After some algebra and applying the boundary conditions, we end up with this integral equation. Um, so you can see here we have our stresses, derivatives of the weighting function over the volume. This is the main elasticity part. We have our tractions over the boundaries, body forces, and the acceleration term. Now we write these uh, weight, trial and weighting functions in terms of a number of, of uh, functions that are def uh, a sort of linear combination of what we call basis functions or often called shape functions in finite elements. Here we have m number of equations, so uh, this n is a function of uh, space. So you could think of this as if we were doing sort of a, in the Fourier space, these would be like sines and cosines. Um, generally, these are linear functions. Uh, in fine elements, they would be uh, spatial, linear spatial variations um, in space. And then our a's are unknowns. Those are our coefficients that are multiplied by the basis functions. After some al algebra, the equation for the degree of freedom i of vertex n is shown here. So when we take the derivatives, we have now derivatives of our shape function instead of derivatives of our trial function. Um, we have uh, our tractions on the boundary multiplied by our shape functions, body forces multiplied by our shape function, and our acceleration term has two shape functions, and that gives us a mass matrix. Um, and this over here on the far left, that gives us our stiffness matrix. So. Uh, that's a very quick overview of how we go from our uh, governing equations of e from elasticity into a final element um, equation. And the manual in the manual, we show how we take this stress uh, and break it up into the pieces um, to get the full constitutive model um, and the stiffness matrix. Uh, for a pilot, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to go now go over how we discuss the topology of a fine element mesh. And so what we do is we take the entire domain, chop it up into little pieces. So in this case, on the left-hand side, I'm showing a 2D domain, very simple, that's divided up into two triangles. On the right is, a, is basically a rectangular domain divided up into two squares. On the bottom, this is how many of you have probably seen fine elements discussed. You have nodes, so in this case, I have nodes two, three, four, and five and cells or elements 0 and 1. In, uh, in Pilot, uh, we number first the cells and then the vertices. Uh, and we don't, when we number the vertices, we don't start from 0. We start from the number after the, um, 
the last cell. And so we go cell is zero, cell one, and then we start a vertex at two, three, four, five. That allows us to basically be given a, uh, a label or a number of um, a fine element uh, piece, we can know exactly where we are. So it uniquely identifies this, the piece. And so here at the bottom, you can see how we have cells 0 and 1. Uh, vertices 2, 3, and 4 are in cell 0. So you can think of this as a tree um, structure. Um, and uh, cell, uh, vertices 3, 4, and 5 are in cell 1. Same thing on the right-hand side, now in this case of a quadrilateral. So we have two uh, quadrilateral cells, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Vertices cell 0 has 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, cell 1 has vertices 4, 5, 6, 7. Um, that is when we just use vertices and, and the cells. Now in Pilot, uh, for version 2.0, we switch to including the edges as well. And this is due to the fact that we uh, will be implementing higher order fine elements. And so instead of having just degrees of freedom on the vertices, we'll have degrees of freedom on the edges. Um, and so now we have cells 0 and 1. And then between the vertices, we have cell, we have edges 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then on edges, each edge has two vertices. If we're in three dimensions, we would have cells, faces, edges, and vertices. And so you see the numbering becomes a little more, there's more numbering going on. It takes up a little more storage. Um, but once you go to higher order, it actually takes up less storage. Um, than if you had the same number of degrees of freedom uh, in the full mesh. Um, but you'll notice, you can see why I didn't draw a 3D diagram, because then I'd have to, I'd have numbers on faces, numbers on edges, and it'd uh, be very, very busy. Um, so this gives you an idea of uh, how we, the topology of a final mesh in that we store the cells, we store how the uh, faces or edges are connected into cells, and then how the uh, vertices are connected into edges. So given any, given vertex 7, I can look up in the data structure and see that it is on edges 2 and 3. If I have edge 3, I can see it is in cell 0. If I am given cell 0, I can see that it is made up of edges 2, 3, and 4. So you can go from the bottom of the tree up or from the top of the tree down. And those are handled by um, the final data structures and operations on those data structures. And in Pilot 2.0, we switched from a, from a C++ data structure that we used in version 1.9 to a full C data structure that is now fully integrated as part of the PETC linear algebra package that uh, Matt Napoli is uh, one of the developers for. Uh, so coming back to our governing equations, we break up um, our integrals uh, in, uh, so in creating the final element mesh, we break it up into integrals, uh, break the, the integrals into sums over cells, and then for beneath each cell, the integration is broken up using numerical quadrature. So our integral equation now becomes a linear algebra. We have sums over volumes of cells, quadrature points, and then you'll notice the same terms we have our stress, derivative of our shape function. Now for numerical quadrature, we have our weight of our uh, of that quadrature point, and then the determinant of the Jacobian that maps from a reference cell that's generally a cube into whatever shape cell we have. And this is where we are quite different from a finite difference where we have uniform size uh, cells. In Pilot, we can have cells, and they may be distorted, elongated in certain directions. They may not be perfect right angles at the edges. They may be sort of slightly warped. Um, and this Jacobian maps from the reference cube into our shape that we have in our mesh. Uh, we then form our uh, linear algebraic equations. We end up with the form AU equals B. Um, that where A in, in our quasi-static system is our stiffness matrix, U is our set of unknowns, B is, can be thought of as our forces. Um, here you'll see the familiar form of, uh, in the case of linear elasticity, one quarter of the elasticity constants, and then you have shape functions um, 
uh, L, K, J, and I, and J. Um, that gives you your full matrix. And then our forces are for the vector B, um, we have our tractions as well as our body forces. Um, and then any specified displacements also end up uh, over on the right-hand side. And so we're going to solve for what uh, U is. Now, faults complicate this a little bit um, in that uh, here I've shown uh, a fault with um, the normal here. And the normal is basically arbitrary assigned. We pick one side to be sort of the reference side. We often call that the negative side of the fault the, and with the normal pointing from the negative side, side to the positive side of the fault. And we use what's known as sort of a decomposition where we separate one side of the fault from the other. Once the fault separates one part of the domain from the other, and it's applying the appropriate boundary conditions on um, one side of the fault to the other side of the fault couples the deformation across the fault. If we don't do any of that coupling, then we have a perfectly free surface, and so they would be unconnected. And so here we're going to show what that uh, hap what happens. So on on a normal uh, boundary condition where we have tractions applied, that's our normal boundary conditions. We have the shape function times the traction vector. We do the same thing for the fault. Only now on the positive side, we'll have we put on a, a negative side out in front. On the negative side of the fault, we put a positive side out in the front out, sign out in front. So this way the uh, we're in, the fault is in equilibrium. Uh, we have equal and opposite tractions on the two sides of the fault. We use, um, here this is L, um, often known as sort of lambda for a Lagrange multiplier, and it's the Lagrange multiplier that couples the two sides of the fault together. Uh, so we have the tractions on the fault. Um, we don't know what the tractions are, and we will include that as an unknown in our solution when we prescribe the slip. And so when we can prescribe the slip, we have a constraint equation that the known slip has to be equal um, uh, to the relative displacement across the fault. So the dis uh, displacement on the positive side of the fault minus the displacement on the negative side of the fault. Um, and in the final element sense, that is satisfied in uh, using the weak form. So we multiply by our weighting function, integrate over the fault surface. And we express our Lagrange multipliers also as a linear combination of our shape functions. In this case, we have a Lagrange multiplier shape function and a slip function for our slip. Um, when we write that all out, our Lagrange multiplier tractions, we have um, the traction uh, matrix transpose times the traction matrix times the Lagrange multiplier. Um, same thing, similar for the constraint equation. And we end up with this modified system of equations. So without uh, the fault, we had A equals B. With the fault, we have a constraint equation. Um, some combination of the displacements is equal to the slip. And so we end up with this modified um, linear set of linear algebra equations um, where we have A, C trans. A U C transpose Lagrange multiplier equals B, and C U equals D for the second equation. So uh, here, these are our displacements within the domain. These are the Lagrange multipliers on the fault. So the the bottom row is a, just a very small fraction of the number of degrees of freedom in the of the top row, um, and we do have zeros on the diagonal. So this creates a saddle point problem, um, and we have to deal with that uh, within our solve. Uh, in a prescribed slip, also known as a kinematic rupture, we specify the fault slip and solve for the Lagrange multipliers as part of the solution. Um, that gives us, in this case, the Lagrange multipliers are the change in tractions on the fault to create that fault slip. In a spontaneous or dynamic slip uh, fault condition, that's where we have fault friction. Um, then we adjust the fault slip to be compatible with a fault constitutive model. Um, so Sarah Stamps is asking if everyone can see. Uh, everyone able to 
Anyone else having problems seeing the screen? Yeah, so, okay, so the, the equations and maybe moving the pointer around is, is uh, maybe moving the pointer a little bit too fast, but um, the equations, this is all gone over much in much more detail in the pilot manual. Um, and so I'll try and use the mouse a little bit less in hopes that things come through. So this is how we uh, do the fault mesh. So um, when we create when the when we create the mesh, we ignore the fact that there's a fault there, and Pilot will automatically insert the fault into the mesh. Um, what you do need to do is you specify where the fault is within the mesh, and you need a surface there for the fault. Um, but you don't worry about uh, splitting what we call adding cohesive cells to the fault. And so this diagram shows how we take the mesh, which uh, does not have the, sort of these positive and negative sides of the fault, um, and we actually insert that into the mesh. Um, so here on the le on under A, I have my original mesh. I have my uh, three fault vertices shown in blue, and then a fault edge vertex shown in green. And so I'll create uh, a node set uh, in qubit with all four vertices, and then I'll create a separate node set for just my buried fault edge that is shown in the green uh, vertex. Um, we give this information to Pilot, and we'll go over that in an example. And so then the next step, what Pilot does automatically is it says, OK, you've given me three uh, fault vertices that are not on an edge. So I take those three vault vertices shown in blue. That's an, I'll take that to be the negative side of the fault. Then I'll take, I'll pick which side, one side to be the, to, uh, from those vertices, I'll pick, you know, the, a normal direction. Um, and it picks it based on the connectivity of those edges. Um, and so you don't know that ahead of time, but it, it so it says, okay, here's the fault. Um, I will then duplicate, add the red vertices in as a pair to each of the blue vertices that's shown there um, here in this case, in the, in the second figure. And I will then create a Lagrange multiplier edge between the red and blue vertices. So I'm adding a Lagrange multiplier vertex to the edge of that fault cell. At the, when I have the green uh, there buried edge, I do not create a, a duplicate uh, vertex on the positive side of the fault. The next step Pilot does is it identifies uh, what cells are on, uh, have faces on the fault. Uh, so for each of those faces on the fault, um, I know that if I have a red vertex, I am on the positive side of the fault. If I have a blue vertex, I'm on the negative side of the fault. And so we identify the edges, uh, sorry, the faces that are on the faults. In this case, it's an edge because it's 2D. And then uh, the other cells that have a vertex on the fault. So in this case, it would be, say, this cell down here. It only has a single vertex on the fault. And so it needs to we uh, so it's set up what side of the fault it is on and whether it needs to get a blue vertex or red vertex based on the adjoining cells. So then at the end, we have the mesh shown on the right where we have split um, the fault. Um, well, we've inserted the fault and our Lagrange multipliers. And we have what are known as these cohesive cells, which are the, um, in this case, it would be a, a blue edge and a red edge connected by a Lagrange multiplier. And even though I've shown a little gap here between the red vertex and blue vertex, they are co-located in space. And so they are. Uh, 
these cohesive cells that are that are the that make up the fault are zero volume or zero area. And so this is how Pylif will insert uh, cells in the cohesive cells into the mesh based on information you give it from the mesh generator. So quickly going through uh, some other issues. Um, we, the advantages of implementing fault slip this way is that the fault implementation is local to the cohesive cell. Um, the rest of the um, mesh doesn't need to know anything about how, how a fault behaves. The solution includes the traction generating the slip, as I was always mentioned. Those are the Lagrange multipliers. We retain the block structure of the matrix, including uh, symmetry. So if our original matrix was symmetric, then adding in the fault this way, we end up with a symmetric matrix. We also the, create actual offsets in the mesh, um, which mimics uh, an abrupt dislocation like we have on a natural fault. We don't have sort of a distorted fault zone with very high shear. Uh, the disadvantage is that we do have to uh, implement this adjusting of the topology of the fine element mesh um, and then developing the, because we have a saddle point, uh, developing a scalable preconditioner solver is more complex. Um, so in general, it's a, you know, from the user perspective, uh, it's easy. All you have to do is create a mesh that has your fault surface in it and identify the vertices on the on the fault surface. From a coding point, it's a little more difficult, but you only have to write the code. Uh, we only had to write the code once and imp keep improving it. We didn't we don't have to do it every single time. Um, we run around want to run a problem. So now let's look at more detail about how you run Pilot. Um, now that you have some background on how it's put together, uh, so you need a mesh generator. In most cases, we're using Qubit and Trellis. Um, and that will create an Exodus file. That's what Pilot will read in. You also need your simulation parameters, and these are divided up into two sets of files. You have uh, a, a single parameter file, or in most cases, sort of a few different parameter files that they are, Pilot will combine them into, uh, into all of its parameters. So if you have, so if you want to, in many cases, we want to run a bunch of problems with the same mesh. And sort of, instead of having to repeat a lot of the same parameters over and over again, you can put all the parameters that are common to those simulations in one file, and then put the one specific to each of the problems in a separate file. Um, and then you just give Pilot the list of those parameter files on the command line, and it'll combine them all um, and uh, if you have uh, sort of conflicting, it'll identify any real conflicts, but generally it'll just replace values with the, the most recent value. So um, if you have incompatible, if you say like, oh, I have Dirichlet boundary condition on this one, and then replace it by attraction boundary condition, it'll do it. But then if you later say, well, my displacements are such and such, it would say, well, you gave me a Neumann boundary condition, attraction boundary condition, but you're just specifying displacements. Uh, then we have what are called spatial databases. These are the variation of the parameters um, within uh, the sort of for a boundary condition. So say you want to specify displacements on a boundary condition rather than just you can specify a uniform value, a linear variation of the value, same thing for traction, same thing for material properties. Um, and we have a number of different types of spatial databases databases that are uniform, that are more efficient, and then you can do linear variations, variations in 2D, like over an area, variations in 3D over a volume. If you have gridded data, um, you can take a pilot, you can tell pilot that, oh, I have a gridded data, you know, the grids, the X coordinates are this, the Y coordinates are that, so it'll do the interpolation in 3D much faster than if you just said, here's a cloud of points. The output from pilot um, there's visualization. You can use VTK files or HDF5 files. Um, the VTK files are ASCII files. They are quite voluminous and um, not very good, especially for time histories. When we're doing real work, research level work, we use HDF5 files, and Paraview needs a little ASCII metadata file called the XDMF file um, to understand how the layout of the HDF5 file. The HDF5 files allow arbitrary access to various 
data points. We have a nice high-level Python interface, so most of our post-processing, whether it's done with Python, with the H5Py module that reads HDF5 files, or MATLAB, which has routines for reading HDF5 files, um, we would use uh, the HDF5 because um, there are readers for that, and you can easily access variables and read them in with essentially one line of code. So I'm only halfway through, but I'm meant to be further along, so I'll quickly go through some of these other things. Spatial databases, uniform value for Dirichlet, that would be an example of a 0D database. Piecewise linear variation tractions for a normal boundary condition, that would be an example of a 1D. And then you have a very complicated 3D variation, such as the SCEC community velocity model. And so there is a special implementation for a version of the SCEC community velocity model. They are generally independent of the discretization of the problem, so that you can, if you change the discretization, say, by a factor of two, um, you should not have to update your spatial database. And so that is quite different from many other file programs where you're specifying the values um, on sort of a point-by-point -point basis on the boundary. And here are some examples um, of the different types of spatial databases. They're covered to more uh, detail in the manual. So if we have zero displacements on our boundary, there's a special database that just says, you know, sets the values to zero to make it uh, even easier and shorter, shorthand for um, a uniform database with values of zero or displacement. Um, now I'm going to go through just the list of features in Tyler 2.0. We have time integration schemes and elasticity formulations for quasi-static problems. We have infinitesimal and small strains. For dynamic problems, we have explicit time stepping, infinitesimal strains, small strains, and numerical damping in both of those cases via artificial viscosity. Um, so if you want seismic waves propagated in your domain, that's when you use explicit time stepping. If you just want sort of quasi-static deformation, no seismic waves, then you use implicit time stepping. Um, for the bulk constitutive models, we have elastic models. Um, we have linear Maxwell viscoelastic models, generalized Maxwell viscoelastic models with three Maxwell models in parallel a power law viscoelastic model, and a drucker prager elastoplastic model. And I should mention that uh, with Pilot 2.0, we no longer support 1D domains. Um, we, uh, we have 2D and 3D, and that's just due to the fact that 1D domains aren't very useful for real problems. Some toy problems, yes. Um, real elasticity, not so much. We have boundary and interface conditions. We have time-dependent Dir and Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions, absorber boundary conditions for dynamic problems where we want to absorb the seismic waves at the truncated edges of the domain. We have prescribed slip fault surfaces with multiple ruptures, dynamic uh, friction fault interfaces, time-dependent point forces, gravitational body forces. For the fault friction, we have static friction, linear slip weakening, linear time weakening, uh, Dietrich Arena rate and state friction with the aging law. We have a number of different uh, time stepping. You can control it with a uniform time step. You can sort of, if you know sort of what time step um, you want as a function of time, you can set that uh, uh, yourself. Or if you have a one of the nonlinear such as the, um, the power law viscoelastic model, and you're not sure what time step you need, you can ask Pilot to set the time step based on the deformation, based on uh, what the viscoelastic model is doing. Um, you can specify initial stress and strain. This is important in problems with gravity where you don't want to turn on gravity and have your entire volume uh, basically collapse under the gravitational load. You can specify initial stress field that's compatible with that gravity field so you don't have any deformation. Um, importing meshes from the great qubit and uh, a simple mesh ASCII file format that's intended for toy problems. Our output, as I mentioned before, VTK and HDF5 files, you can output the solution over the entire domain, that's the volume, over uh, the surface boundary, that's usually the ground surface where most of our observations are. 
And you can also have it interpolated to user-specified points, such as GPS site. Uh, you can also output state variables, such as stress and strain for each material. There may have additional state variables for uh, the viscoelastic model, so you can output things like viscous strain. For the fault, you can output slip, the tractions, and in friction, you can specify out the, the state variables, such as rate and state friction. You can output the state variable if you wanted that. Uh, Pilot provides automatic conversion of all units. Um, so inside Pilot, Pilot uses non-dimensionalization, and that's important because you need to make sure your scales are set correctly. We'll discuss that during the workshop. We have parallel uniform global refinement, so you can generate your mesh at, say, twice the resolution, sorry, a coarser resolution by a factor of two, and then have it refine in parallel that allows you to run a larger problem. Uh, we interface with Pepsi linear and nonlinear solvers, and we provide a custom preconditioner and al with an algebraic multigrid solver through Pepsi. We'll talk about that more at the workshop. Uh, so to give you an idea of what we're working on now in Pilot, our immediate priorities are a new fault implementation for spontaneous rupture um, that provides much faster convergence for quasi-static problems. We're really excited about this um, because uh, right now, if you have a through-going fault, um, it can be agonizing slow convergence. I mean, it does converge, but it just converges very slowly. Um, we figured out a way to a new formulation that handles the Lagrange multiplier in a different way um, that uh, will speed this up um, so it'll take only a few iterations to converge. Uh, it would also allow us working on improved handling of fault intersections. Right now, you have to have a little gap, one cell between faults. Um, that'll be removed so you can actually have a T intersection of one fault coming up and intersecting the other. The slip will die out to zero on the fault that's coming in and terminated by the other fault. Uh, Short-term priorities, these are sort of, the immediate priorities are sort of what we wished we'd had for the workshop but haven't quite finished yet, but we hope to have those done in the next month or so. The short-term priorities are sort of what we're looking at for uh, a longer time scale, um, probably in the fall or early 2015. That's high order basis functions that allow us a much higher resolution for a given mesh. A multi-grid nonlinear solver, Matt's already been working on that, um, and further preparation for multi-physics. Uh, in the release following that, we intend to have multi-cycle earthquake modeling, um, where you can roll out coupling between solvers for quasi-static and dynamic deformation with adaptive time stepping. And then the, on the multi-physics side, we want to have elasticity coupled with heat flow and fluid flow. Um, and uh, in the process, we're working on uh, additional scaling issues so that we can go to much larger, run on much larger machines. So here's our sort of timeline, expected timeline for releases. Um, we had originally intended to have version 2.0 out at the end of last calendar year. Um, but when we changed all of our data structures, we essentially broke everything. So we spent a lot of time fixing all the things we broke, and so it's come down to sort of summer of early summer of 2014 rather than late 2013. Um, but we still expect to have this other release later this summer with the new fault implementation and better handling of fault intersections. Uh, then we're calling version, version 3, where we have higher order basis functions, um, adaptive time stepping, and then um, the release following that would have the multi-physics capabilities and will work in sort of the other earthquake cycle issues as things continue to move forward. Um, I'll try and wrap this up in the next five minutes so we can let Charles take over. Um, our design philosophy for Pilot is that the code should be flexible, modular. Um, users should be able to add features without modifying the code. Um, so far, no users have really done a whole lot outside of sort of the primary developers. Eventually, we hope to change that, especially as we go to multi-physics. Um, the intent is to, and our design is to make it much easier to, for people to add their own things. Um, Top-level code is written in Python. This uh, is used because it allows expressive dynamic typing and actually allows users to add in modules without having to touch the original code. Um, but we need, Python is not fast, and so we need a low-level code 
which is written in C++, Pilot code is written in C++, the Petsy code is written in C. Um, here's all the things that Pilot depends on. So Pilot is really limited primarily to the physics part of the code. We use Petsy for our data structures, final data structures, linear algebra and solvers, spatial data, which is another um, sort of separate code that I wrote um, that is used primarily by Pilot, um, and then Fiat for our basis functions. Uh, spatial data depends on the Proj4 geographic projection library. It uses a framework called Pyre that is also used by Pilot. That's mostly the Python. And then NumPy is a Python module that is widely used for um, dealing with matrices, vectors, and so forth. Then we have our uh, IO libraries, NetCDF. That's what Qubit actually writes Exodus files with um, in HDF5. And then Blastly, Peck, and MPI on the bottom. So that's why it's difficult to compile Pilot from source, but it also means that we ourselves maintain a lot less code and rely on these other major libraries to provide functionality. Um, each of the components within Pilot, um, and you should really think of Pilot as a hierarchy of components, um, has sort of at the top level uh, the Python code where we gather user input. Then there's the low-level code, which may or may not exist, and, and it's very high-level objects. They don't have the C++. And we use uh, a tool called Swig to merge those together. Um, here's a sort of uh, a little diagram of what the very top-level part of Pyloth looks like. There's no C++. It's just Python. So we have properties are, are sort of simple strings, numbers, facilities, or other objects. So the pilot main has a mesh generator problem and, and an interface to Pepsi. The problem is we have a time-dependent problem, and so that's what we show on the right. We also have a Green's function problem. The time-dependent problem has a dimension. That's the spatial dimension. Then it has a normalizer for non-dimensionalization, has materials, boundary conditions, fault interfaces, a gravity field, and then the time-stepping formulation. And then, of course, uh, each of those has its own subset. An example for the fault showing this hierarchy of components is here's our kinematic prescribed fault uh, object. It has an ID, it has a name for the fault, the up direction, normal direction, um, which are, uh, are hints to pilot to how it defines wh which side of the fault is which. Um, and then it has quadrature for the integration, earthquake sources for prescribing the slip and output. And so an earthquake source, shown over on the right, has an origin time and a slip function. Um, and then the slip function can be any number of different slip functions that we have uh, in the code. So this is a very simple problem. I believe this is step 01 in examples 3D hex 8. So it's uh, just prescribing a shear deformation in a box. We have roller boundary conditions on the bottom, axial. Uh, displacement as well as shear. Uh, when you look at it in terms of the hierarchy of components, it looks like this. Um, so you can see even these simple problems have a number of, uh, made up of a number of components. Many of these are defaults, so all you have to do is fill in what you want to change from the default. Um, this is the application flow, so in main we create the mesh, we initialize the problem, and we run. So the top level Object is very simple. Then in sort of the problem, if it's a time-dependent problem, we initialize the formulation. And in, in the run of a time-dependent problem, we say, well, while t is less than the end time, then prepare for a time step, do the time step, and then the do the post-time step. Um, and so pre-step for uh, quasi-static simulation, we set the values on the constraints. In the step, we compute the residual and solve for the displacement increment. In the post step, we update the displacement field with the displacement increment and write output. Uh, Pilot has a bunch of testing. I think we can skip that. Um, basically, that's to instill confidence that the code works well. Um, and quickly, here are some general numerical modeling tips. Start in 2D if possible, then go to 3D. Um, this allows you to start with a much smaller problem and gives you much faster turnaround between running the problem as well as generating the mesh. Um, Matt, our computational gurus, 
recommend starting with an exact solver that removes removes some uh, difficulties or complexities in dealing with iterative solvers. Uh, you, this is where you want to experiment with your meshing boundary conditions, solvers, etc. But if you're doing a simple 2D problem, keep in mind how the physics differs from 3D. Um, as you go to 3D, you want to start with the coarse resolution and increase the resolution only as needed. Um, as with 2D, this gives you smaller problems, faster turnaround. Um, you know, experiment with your meshing boundary conditions solvers. Work from the simplest to gradually adding complexity. Um, the resolution will depend on the spatial scales in your boundary conditions, initial conditions, the deformation, and the geologic structure. Um, right now, you can get really high topography for a lot of problems, but you, the question you need to ask is at what res resolution is that topography important? If in many cases you may be fine using a flat surface, um, which greatly speeds up the mesh generation. Um, and you only include topography when you need it, when you have a really sort of large topographic feature that is going to influence your displacement field. Uh, the, the displacement field is the integral of stresses and strains. So you don't need nearly the same resolution to resolve the displacement field as you do strains and stresses. So you'll, if you're interested in the stresses and strains in a domain, then you'll need a much finer resolution than you need if you just cared about the displacements. And uh, with all these uh, sophisticated solvers and tools, um, don't throw your intuition in, out the window. It's very important to be able to judge what your solution looks like to know if it makes sense or you've made a mistake. Um, we'll cover this more in the workshop. That's just what type of mesh uh, uh, you want to use and how to do it. Uh, our tips are read the pilot user manual. Don't ignore error messages and warnings. Use an example or one of our benchmarks as a starting point. Um, you always want to make sure your solution is converging. Um, and uh, if you need help, you can reach Matt, Charles, and I, as well as the rest of the community at this email list, cig-short at geodynamics.org. We strongly recommend that you join that mailing list if you're not already. Um, and uh, there's a, a pilot wiki that has uh, our development plan as well as, as well as sort of some basic hints, tips, and tricks uh, for using Pilot. Uh, we'll cover debugging it in the workshop, so I think I'll skip that. Um, and uh, just want to point out, Chapter 7 of the Pilot Manual has a lots of examples. Um, we hope that before the workshop you have time to go through some of those. Um, it'll greatly make it greatly speed up your ability to digest what we're talking about at the workshop. Um, the examples are included in the pilot binary and source pilot-2.0.0 slash examples. If you're installing from source using the installer, which we don't recommend you do unless you're running on a cluster, in that case you actually do need to, they'll be in source examples. Um, and if you want to get started on a research problem, find an example that looks similar and start, start working with it um, uh, and sort of adjusting it, modifying it to meet your needs. Are there questions at this point? I realize we went pretty fast through a bunch of that. Um, uh, well, this is being recorded, so you can go back and, and go through that, as well as our previous tutorials that are online and the user manual. Uh, question is, does the software support axisymmetric models? Um, not radially symmetric, because we don't use um, sort of a, a radial symmetry. Um, we have a number of problems um, where we've made use of symmetry, such as uh, Perpendicular to the fault, we'll put in uh, boundary conditions so that the deformation um, is uh, is symmetric. Um, you cannot uh, slice, you cannot have the fault plane on an axis of symmetry um, because we need both sides of the fault. Um, generally, Pilot is really designed where for problems where you don't have symmetry. In some cases, if you have a lot of symmetry, then you can use uh, codes that are going to give you an answer um, faster with less computational cost. 
Um, Kang Wang has a question. Um, can pilots deal with multiple fault strands? Um, yes. Uh, if they intersect, you, at this point in 2.0, you have to have a one cell, at least one cell in between them. Um, in our next version, we uh, intend to allow uh, T intersections. Um, you, if your faults aren't intersecting, then you can have as many faults as you want. There's no limit to the number of faults that you can have. Um, uh, it does tend to create, every, for every fault you have, you have that many additional saddle points. Um, so it does stress the solver more the number of faults that you have. So at this point, um, we may run a little over in terms of our, our timing since we ran a little long going through the slides, but I'm going to turn it over now to Charles to walk through um, uh, example problem. In, uh, and he'll, he'll give you sort of a hands-on view of running pilot and generating the mesh in qubit. Okay, yeah. Um, I apologize. I think I accidentally deleted a couple of questions when I thought I was just minimizing them. So, um, <laughs> sorry about that. Let's see. Is there a... Um, Oops, you, you, sorry, Charles. I was going to see if you had the.